morning. Okay, praise God. It's good to be here this morning. And the sun is going to stay out a little bit longer today than it has for a long time. Amen to that. I mean, just this taste of spring that's out there today. I can just imagine all of you running around in shorts and t-shirts this afternoon. <laughs> just like, you know, an utter joy saying, I don't care if it's 40 degrees out. I've been waiting to this for what seems like forever. Uh, we're so thankful for uh, the conference that's been taking place over in Europe. My, all the reports that we've heard have been great. And also, um, you know, we've been having the opportunity to look at some of the services, to hear some of the messages, and just been outstanding. Amen. So, praise God. I'm going to take a drink of water here. They've got this little sign here that says, Water for Pastor Schaller only. Over here, a little sign, this stuff is for the rest of you losers. Now, that's not right. Ken, I know you put that there. That is not edifying at all. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. All right, Father, thank you for gathering us here this morning. And uh, thank you, Lord, for your goodness toward us. And Lord, we're here this morning because, as the psalmist said, our souls cleave to the dust. It's just their nature to do that. But then he said this, quicken us according to your word. Quicken us, make us alive this morning as we gather in your name in this place. That natural propensity, Father, that we sense that just draws us back to the dust, the only thing that can counter it is the proclamation of your thoughts, your words. We thank you for them this morning. Bless this message. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The theme throughout the week at Eurocon, at the conference, has been an open door. Something that God has given to each one of us as members of the body of Christ and then as a church in particular. When you stop and think about the nature of our, our ministry, its history, we have had a lot of open doors. We really have. And at the same time, I think it's safe to say that we have also come across some closed doors. And I think that in the course of each one of our lives, um, that's something that we will forever see. Open doors, closed doors. But what we have as a great advantage in our lives is that we know that God is behind the opening of doors. He's also behind the closing of some other doors, amen? And sooner or later, we will all come face to face with some closed doors. And when we do, sometimes, if you're anything like me, you are surprised because we don't understand what God is doing. We have every intention of coming up to certain doors and walking through them, believing that those doors will be open and it's going to be the will of God in our lives that we would walk right through them. But the fact of the matter is we come up to those doors and they are closed. Now, we can be stubborn, and we all have that tendency, and we will say, well, you know, I'm here, and I feel as though I've been led up to this point, so I'm not going anywhere. We look for a crowbar, some other tools, anything we can find, and our attitude is, if God won't open this door, I will do it for him. I will knock the door down. I will remove the hinges from the door and I will get through it. But obviously in our lives we've come to realize that that is not the wisest decision. Maybe it's closed for a purpose. Maybe God doesn't want us to go through that door. So we try a different door. It would be like we have prayer in the chapel here on Tuesday mornings and most often this door right to my right, to your left, is open and we come through that door. Now imagine... If, you know, prayer meeting Tuesday morning and that door is locked. Now, I can hear that they are praying in the chapel. Don't you think it would make sense that rather than banging on that door, 
interrupting the prayer meeting that I would just kind of look throughout the rest of the chapel and try to find an open door. That's sometimes how God leads us. If one door is closed, it's closed for a reason, and it may be that God is opening another one. Do you ever have that in your experience? You go to one door after another, and it seems like, and when, I say, when I'm, using, I'm using that door, that word metaphorically, an opportunity, something that you're looking forward to, something that you've anticipated, something that you've prayed about. But as you go to each door, what happens? No one responds to your resume. I remember when I went to Bible college in Lenox, Massachusetts, there were not a lot of jobs in Lenox, Massachusetts. And most people said, you will end up working in a restaurant or because of these many group homes that were settled throughout the Berkshires, they said you will work with children that have emotional and mental diseases and sicknesses. And, you know, a lot of those groups homes where, where young people were there and they were sent there, not just from Massachusetts, but all over the country. And I said to the person who was telling me that, I said, well, you know, my father-in-law used to work at General Electric, which was in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, right beside Lenox. And I have put together this wonderful resume, and he has given me his recommendation, and he knows a senior official at General Electric. And I, I was just sitting there, and I said, I, I've got it made. I'm all set. I have lunch with him tomorrow, so I won't be working at a restaurant, and I won't be working with severely emotionally disturbed young people. Off I went to my meeting the next day, sat down with this senior official at General Electric. He was very kind. He was very helpful. But in the end, as he looked over at my resume, he said, you know, I, I don't think we have anything available. And, you know, you just kind of wanted to say, but you, you know my father-in-law. Uh, this is supposed to work this way. I came all the way from Massachusetts. I worked hard because I'm going to Bible college. You have to, where's the open door? And he says, I'm sorry. Basically, what he was saying was this, this door is closed. So I went back, and the person who told me, you're going to work either in a restaurant or with severely emotionally disturbed young people, he said, he just kind of had a smile on his face, and he said, come on, let's go down to the Avalon School where the emotionally disturbed young men and women are. And I said, no, 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 I can't do that. I have no experience in doing that. He said, don't worry. He says, they won't bite you every day. <laughs> and now he's got me even more freaked out. And so I, I kept saying, no, I'm going to look, I'm going to go to this door. And I went to another door and it was closed. And then I went to another door and it was closed. And every day, you know, I, I had to call my wife and say, well, I haven't got any employment opportunities yet, but just hang in there. And I remember hanging up the phone and this, that, my friend was right there. He just had a big smile on his face. He says, tell me when you're ready to go to Avalon, I'll drive you down there. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, I ended up working at Avalon. What an experience. And I kept saying, God, why? Why here of all places? Such a danger, it was such a dangerous place to work. You did not know if you were going to be clobbered in the head from behind, attacked on any given morning. I remember Pastor Ron DeLewis, he worked there. And I remember, this is what I saw my first couple of weeks at Avalon. He would come into the cafeteria with his student. He was dealing with a one-on-one -on -one student, and she was at the table, and uh, she wasn't very highly functional, and he was helping her out and preparing breakfast. And, and all of the, uh, the, the, the silverware and the, the dishes, they were all plastic. And so she had a cup of uh, juice or something, and she drank her juice, and then she just took that cup, and she just smashed him on the head. And he, I mean, he, he staggered. The blood is pouring down his head. And, and I thought to myself, whoa, whoa. I, I, I was grateful to God that the person I was watching, I was a little bit bigger than they were. So I thought, well, if they attack me, I can handle myself. You couldn't, I mean, you couldn't hurt these children, obviously, but if you had to, you, you could restrain them. So he walks out and he goes off to the hospital and he gets stitches. And of course, the next day, he walks into the cafeteria once again, same young lady, and she finishes her juice once again and takes the cup and splits his head open again. And I thought, oh, thank you, Lord. What a great job. I'm so happy to be here. And <laughs> off he goes to be stitched up yet again. Day three. Same scenario. 
into the cafeteria, finishes her juice. This time he's kind of looking, you know, out, out of the corner of his eye. He's wising up a bit. And sure enough, she goes to the cup. He grabs her by the arm and he stood up and he said, I quit. And he walked out the door. And I had no idea what God was preparing me for. And I even said, Lord, what, what, what is this all about? Why? Why am I working here with all of these severely mentally and emotionally disturbed young people? Why? Oh, God, why? And you know what he said? Because you're going to work in the church someday. <laughs> I said, of course. <laughs> of course. But have you ever had that experience? No college accepts, or no, no job accepts your resume, no college accepts your application, no doctor has an answer for your illness, no potential buyers for the home, and the list could just go on and on and on. Obstacles block your path, your road seems to be barricaded. You know the frustration of a closed door. We all know the frustration of doors that are closed. The Apostle Paul knows about closed doors. He had a number of them in his life. He also had a number of open doors, which is amazing. And we're so grateful for the open doors, but this morning I would almost want us to focus more on the closed doors because sometimes we don't know it, but the reason behind God closing a door for us is so that he can open a better one. But we don't see it that way. I, if you're anything like me, I get frustrated because of closed doors. I get confused when I come to a closed door. I can almost get reactionary toward God when I come to a closed door, only to understand and to realize after the fact that it was necessary, that it was needful in God's plan and in God's timing. In Acts chapter 14, the 27th verse, listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote. This was, was Paul and Silas and Timothy. They were on their, their second missionary journey. Verse 27 says, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. Awesome. That's pretty much as he's getting ready to his to begin his second missionary journey. He's kind of wrapping up his first one, and he enjoyed such amazing success on that first missionary journey. At every step of the way, it seemed like God opened a door and God opened another door. And the scripture tells us in the book of Acts that God opened doors into Cyprus, Antioch, Iconium. He opened the door of grace or of grace to the council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, which was a major major source of victory throughout all of the churches, especially for the Gentiles who were being locked out of some churches simply because that they were Gentiles. So God was doing incredible things. And these missionaries at this time, you know what they felt like? They felt like that the, the wind was at their back. It was incredible. But then the winds began to turn, as they sometimes do. In Acts chapter 16, you turn the page Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia, and they were come to Mysia and assayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Notice that. Paul set his sights on Asia. He believed that that's where God was leading them on this missionary journey. Yet what? No doors seemed to open. So they turned north, and as they did, guess what they discovered? More blocked doors. Now, we're not told in the Scripture why they were blocked, just that God did not open them. And I would imagine that the Apostle Paul made of the same stuff as you and I are made of, and I think sometimes we think, no, different. He had to be different. He was of a different character, a different nature, a different makeup altogether. No, made of dust, just like you and I, probably confused, probably bewildered, probably questioning God, probably wondering what's going on, why this long extension of success, why these many open doors, and now 
We are being barricaded. We are being forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we don't understand why the doors are closed, but God closes them. And, and we could say this too. He still does. He owns the key to every door, doesn't he? According to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it says that God is always opening doors that no one can lock and locking doors that no one can open. It is a great thing to be in contact with somebody who has all the keys. You know, that's what I love about Scott Dubay. Whenever you get in trouble, whenever you lose your keys, whenever something is misplaced, you just call Scott Dubay. Why? Because he's got a key to every single door in this church. He's like the Jesus of our church. <laughs> he's the great door unlocker. He, uh, he can open any door. And if he wants to lock certain doors, he will when Pastor Taggart tells him to do so. But the fact is, he's got all the keys. Well, remember, Jesus has all the keys. The keys of David, the keys of life, even the keys to Hades itself. He's got them all. And this should put within our hearts a great sense of peace and a great sense of confidence and a relaxed mental attitude and a life that we can pursue uh, anxiety-free, worry-free, care-free. Why? Because God could get us through any door he wants to, but sometimes he doesn't. And when we reach that place in our lives, don't try to force that door down. Don't try to get through a door that God clearly has not opened. You know, once God closes a door, <laughs> no one can open it. We read about that. We read in the Old Testament that God was the one who closed the door of Noah's ark. Do you think anybody was going to get into that door once God closed it? Absolutely not. The opportunity had presented or been presented to all of those people on the planet for 120 years. Noah preached about righteousness. He preached about impending judgment. He preached about the fact that God was going to send his judgment upon the earth. And opportunity after opportunity was presented. But once that door was closed, nobody was going to open it. There was a time when God, I know you could say people did it, but God directed soldiers to seal the tomb of Jesus. Believe me, nobody was going to remove that seal. That was a door that was closed until God himself decided to open it three days later, which we'll be celebrating very soon. But once he blocks a door, it cannot be opened. And during a season of blocked doors, and sometimes it's like that, you don't have an occasional blocked door, you have seasons of locked doors, and that can make us frustrated. But I think God blocks those doors in order to protect us, to keep us from spiritual disaster. Do you ever think about that? You know, do you ever have one of those scenarios where you think about what if at a crossroads in your Christian life or maybe even before you were born again, do you ever think about what might have been, what your life could have looked like if you had married the wrong person, right? I always thought that there was this person, uh, I just, in my heart, I said, oh, I'm going to marry this person. And I just knew it. And, and, and uh, you know, God shut that door real quick. And it was like, oh, my God, what's going on? Well, because he had someone better for me. And I hope you're listening, Maureen. So <laughs> you'd be edified this morning. Much better, exceedingly better, gloriously better. But, but sometimes... I remember how disappointed I was, right? I mean, sometimes we can get that way. Do you ever have a, a sense of expectation built up in your soul and then to have it dashed to pieces? I remember trying out as a young person for, you know, a hockey team, and I, I was working hard, and I was devoting myself at practices, and, and I wasn't very big, and I was kind of small, so I wondered if I even had a chance against some of these bigger, taller stronger players, and I worked so hard, and all of the indications, all of the indications were, it looks good, it looks like you'll be chosen, and I got excited. Then my father came home, and he said, I talked to one of the coaches, he said, you had a great practice, things look good, and I was like, thank you, Lord, well, I don't think I thanked God back then, but I, I was like, oh, thank me, and, and, and <laughs> I just was so excited, so much so that on the day that they were going to choose that team, God bless her, my mother baked this beautiful cake and put on it, congratulations. 
And I came into the house. The cake was out there. Everybody was excited. Obviously, we didn't have any real purpose in our lives. It was only to celebrate hockey. So, you know, so I come in. And then the phone rings. And, and my, my father says, it's for you. And, I, and, and, I, and then I get that news. Uh, we're, we're so sorry. But you didn't make the team. So I went in and informed everybody and, you know, just wanted to take the cake and throw it against the wall, but I didn't. And, you know, I've got seven brothers and sisters. Some of them were like, oh, it's okay. The other ones were like, <laughs> I, you know, that's the way it is in a big family. You know, told you you weren't any good. But, you know, hey, why was that door closed? I don't know. I don't know. But there had to be some reason for it. I don't know. Maybe, you know, who knows? Uh, something disastrous is going to take place. But all I know is with that closed door, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to run away. I just want to devote myself, and I want to become a better hockey player. And, 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 I, and I think I did that to some extent, but I enjoyed life. I went on, and instead of playing hockey, this is what happened. I was playing hockey six nights a week before I got saved. And then I got saved. And then I was playing hockey five nights a week. And then I met my wife. And, and we started dating four nights a week. And then I got married. And I never saw the skates again. <laughs> Until recently. But it was like, I think that God was saying, listen, I'm going to take you away from hockey. And I'm going to give you a real life and a real reason to live. I'm just going to close that door. Just like he does for us. From our perspective, it seems like setbacks. But God sees an opportunity to keep us from a wrong door so that he has the privilege of leading us through the right one. This can't happen unless we learn to walk by faith. We, we cannot walk by sight. We have to walk by faith. We have to walk by means of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And then when you do, guess what happens? Closed doors take on new meaning. You see them not as interruptions in your life, but indications of God's plan for your life. And that's the best way to look at closed doors because they are going to happen and we've got to get used to them. And we have to be able to discern between what is a closed door and what is a door that God is clearly opening for us. The Apostle Paul, there they are. Can you just imagine this missionary journey just kind of stops in its tracks? No doubt some people on his team are wondering, well, what's next? Every time we attempt to go to this city, it's closed. Every time we attempt to go north, it's closed. Every time we, we try to move towards this vision of Asia that God has placed in our hearts, we can't go there. But you know what happened? The closed doors in Asia led to the open-armed invitation to Europe. That's what happened. The verses go on and says this. Verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia... And prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for the preach the gospel unto them. Imagine that. One translation says, And we made a straight course. Once again, what's happening? No closed doors, but now the wind is behind them again. Because God was saying, No, not Asia, not now. I need you to go to Europe, and I'm going to open that door for you, and I'm going to give you free course, and you're going to find that there will be no hindrances, no barricades, no blockades. That's God opening the right doors. If you keep reading in the 16th chapter, verse 14, they finally get to Europe, and it says, And a certain woman of, named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. That was after a few days. They meet this, they meet this woman named Lydia, and the Lord opened her heart. Isn't that great when God opens people's hearts? Do you remember when your heart was open? I remember when my heart was opened. It was closed. It was shut. There was no reaching me. There was no reaching you. But then God opened our hearts, just like he opened Lydia's heart to respond to the message that Paul was preaching. This was the first convert in the western part of the world. Christ purposely led them to the first European disciple 
ever in the church. He did that. And you, you might think, well, well, would God do something like that? Would God forbid them to go into a whole other part of the world just so that he could find one convert? Absolutely. Absolutely. You wonder why sometimes you're working at that job and you've been at that job for so long. It could be that one person that God has you there for. That one person who has observed the integrity of your life. That one person who has marveled at your Christian testimony day after day, week after week, even year after year. And who knows if God isn't going to open their heart. There's a reason. There's always a reason. And then, of course, they preach. They're, now they're at Philippi, and they're preaching. And God is blessing once again, and he's opening doors in that town. And what happened? Oh, it's amazing. They get there, and God starts to do great things. The team went to work. God moved, and pagan religious leaders were mad. They were angry. Next thing you know, they trumped up false charges against Paul and Silas. And then what happens next? They are thrust into prison. And what happens? They hear the closing of a prison cell door behind them. You would think, no, no, no. He didn't bring us through this door just so that he could lock another one and put us behind bars. Did they complain? No, they did not. Were they worried? No, they, didn't. they weren't worrying at all. What were they doing? They began to sing. They start to sing praises to God at midnight. Can you imagine what it must have been like if you were a fellow prisoner in that jail? These guys are crazy. It says they put their feet in stocks, but you can do that to the believer as long as their minds are still in heaven. And that's where Paul and Silas were. And that's where we find ourselves even when our circumstances have forced upon us a door that just cannot be opened. Now what are they going to do? Another closed door? It's all right. They sang, and what happened? God, you know, and, and, and again, if he doesn't have a key, no problem. He'll use an earthquake. No problem. And I can't imagine what it must have been like for everybody else in those cells. All of a sudden, there's an earthquake a after the singing. They, they must have been thinking either God did not like that singing or God likes them a real lot. But all the doors are open, but nobody leaves. The Philippian jailer takes out his sword because he knows the penalty as a Roman soldier, as a Roman centurion. He knows the penalty for releasing prisoners under his watch. It is absolute certain death. So he figures, I'll just take matters into my own hands. I'll take my own life before my authorities take my life. And as he's about to run himself through, Paul says, hey, do yourself no harm. We are all here. Nobody's left. Wow. Now God, what does he do? He unlocks those doors. Everybody's doors. I think it's amazing. They sang. God shakes the prison. The jailer is saved. How about that? And then we read that the jailer, he comes, comes in, you know, shaking, trembling before Paul. And I said, what do I, this is what he says, what do I have to do to be saved? You can just imagine Paul looking at Silas and saying, another open door. Another open door. And, and th then what does it say? It says that this Philippian jailer washed their wounds. Wow. While he washed their wounds, Jesus washed his sins away. Now he's saved. Now his whole home is saved. Now there's a family in Philippi that can share Christ with others. God's in the business of opening doors. He's also in the business of closing doors. But whatever he does, it's always right. And it's always right right on time. God will close doors to advance his cause. He will open doors so that he can reach people because with God, it's all about people, isn't it? Next time you come face to face with a closed door, you should be thinking this way. I should be thinking this way. Lord, this door is closed because somehow you want to reach someone. You want to touch someone. You want to make a difference in somebody's life and you might even be able to use me. I want to be available. I want to be sensitive. I'm not going to live in frustration. I'm not going to live in anxiety. I'm not going to live in fear. Those things will cripple my spiritual life, and I don't want that to happen. I want to walk by faith. 
I want to trust you. I want to relax in the, the circumstances I find myself in because if I'm not at the right door, then please lead me to the better one you have ordained for my life. He will do that. He closed the door to Sarah's womb, so to speak, so that he could display his power to an elderly Sarah and Abraham. God did that. He shut the door of the palace to Moses, the prince at that time, so that he could open the shackles of the children of Israel through Moses the liberated. That's how God works. Because Moses realized when he tried to liberate Israel in his own strength, in his own time, that that was a closed door. But then God said, wait 40 years, I will open a better one. And you will see how powerful I am. He marched Daniel out of, out of Jerusalem. And he marched him all the way into Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom in Babylon. Why? Because he wanted to use Daniel and his three Hebrew friends in Babylon. God did that. He even said no to Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, please, could I be spared of this? And God said no. And he did that so that he could say yes to all of us when we showed up at the gates of eternity. That's the way God works, sometimes saying no, but for his reasons. Be sensitive to those closed doors. Be available to the open ones of God. God's goal has always been the same. It's people. It's always people. He'll, he'll stir up a storm if he has to to display his power. He'll, he'll keep Paul and his team out of Asia if it means that they could reach a soul like Lydia and then the Philippian jailer and then his family and who knows how many more souls after that. It's just the way God works. Let me share this story with you. Story of a brother named Colt McCoy, quarterback. Because this is kind of a story that how God will sideline, sideline rather, a great quarterback in the biggest game of his season. That's what it was. This happened in the 2010 BCS National Championship game. Can you imagine? You've been a quarterback for four years at the University of Texas. Outstanding. You're going to be potentially picked as a, a number one draft pick when you get to the NFL. And you're at the biggest game of your career. And God decided to close that door for Colt McCoy. He had enjoyed four years of open doors. He was the winningest signal caller in the history of collegiate football. But in the national championship game, the most important contest of his university career, a shoulder injury, put him out of the game in the first quarter. It was like slam, the door was closed. Colt spent most of the game in the locker room. How about it? Now, while in that locker room, there's no telling. Was he singing? Like Paul and Silas? I don't know. But we know he was trusting. After the game, this is what he said. He said, I love this game. I've done everything I can to contribute to my team. It's unfortunate I didn't get a chance to play. I would have given everything I had to be out there with my team. But I always give God the glory. I never question why things happen the way they do. He said, God's in control of my life. And I know that if nothing else, I'm standing on the rock. What a testimony. Even on a bad night, Colt McCoy gave a good testimony about God. Did God close the door of the game so that he can open the door of somebody's heart? Probably. The story goes on. Colt's father shared this story with his son and with others. A young football player approached Brad McCoy, Colt's father, after he returned from the game and said, I heard what your son said after the game, but I have one question. He says, what is the rock? McCoy responded and said, well, well, son, he said, we sing about him in our church. And then he began to sing the hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that young man accepted Christ as his savior. Would God do such a thing? Would he keep this, this premier athlete off the field of play in the most important game of what he thought was his career as a quarterback? The answer to that is maybe. Yes, it could happen. But if he closed that door, 
It was for the good intention of opening somebody's heart. Just like he does with us. Just like he's still doing today. Yes, throughout the course of our lives, we will find open doors, but we will find probably more than a few closed doors. But God is behind all of them. His greatest concern are people's lives. It's not that our plan is bad. It's just that God's plans are so much better. That's why we trust him. That's why we wait upon him. That's why we seek him. That's why we gather together like we are this morning. That's why we worship him. Because we've come to realize that even when we get to that door, that we absolutely have the assurance in our hearts that it's going to be open, it's going to swing wide open, and we're going to go, just kind of go through it with the winds at our back. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But all the time God leading and you and I resting as he leads us. It's God trying to teach us. Doesn't mean when you reach a blocked door that God doesn't love you. I think it's proof of the opposite. It's showing you and I how much he does love us. And I think when we get to eternity, somebody said the first thing that we're going to say when we get into the presence of God is, of course, of course. He's going to show us some of those doors that we were so intent on getting through and then show us why he blocked them. Why he closed them. And we're going to say, of course. And we're going to reflect back and say, I don't think I remember saying, of course, then. I think I remember raising my fist and its object was your face, God. But now, with that eternal perspective, we can say, God, yes, you do all things well. You are always good. You are always righteous. You always care for us. You always have our best interests ahead of what we think might be our best. You love us. You care for us. And when you express that care, sometimes it reveals itself with a closed door, sometimes with an open door. It doesn't matter. I'm going to trust the one who holds all the keys. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? This morning, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ in a personal way, you've never believed on him, never made him your personal savior. Well, he's got the key to your heart. And he can open your heart. So many of us here this morning, virtually almost all of us, I would imagine, have had our hearts opened by God. And we have never regretted it, not once. He came into our hearts. He saved us. He took up his residence within our hearts. He's seated today on the throne of our hearts. He reigns, he rules, he's sovereign, he's our king. We worship him, we trust him, we walk with him. You can do the same. Just open your heart and say, Jesus, come in, live, cleanse me of my sin. Just like that Philippian jailer. He might have been washing the wounds of Paul and Silas, but at the same time, God was washing his sins away. Trust Christ, accept him, believe on him, be saved at this moment. Say, Jesus, come into my heart and live and make me your own. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if there's anyone in the audience this morning that said that prayer, would you put your hand up so that we can pray for you? Just put it up and put it right back down. Anyone here this morning, thank you so much in the back. God bless you. Anyone else? Before we close the service, anyone, just put it up. Put it back down. You're trusting Christ. You're being born again. Father, thank you. If this service and these open doors into this chapel was so that this one heart this morning could be opened, we praise you. We thank you. We worship you. We magnify your holy name. Thank you, Jesus, for that soul which is worth more than the whole world. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.